Hey, good day, everybody. Dave Walker here again with the B2 SMB Institute. And we are in our continuing series of showcasing the brands that have been nominated for our 2021 Best of SMB Awards. We are going to be talking to a brand of the year nominee, and that is Alignable. And I am joined by Eric Groves, who's the co founder and CEO of Alignable. Welcome, Eric. Thanks for having us. And I'm also joined by a fellow marketer, a fellow CMO, and that is Maureen Plowman. Welcome, Maureen. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really great to have you, you guys both here. You know, I, we've had so many new members join in the last six months that I don't want to presume that everybody knows who Alignable is. God knows they should. Um, but who Alignable is, Eric, how, you know, Alignable came about. Could you kind of give us the the, a little bit of history of yourself, of Alignable, and, and where you guys are today. Absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, thank you um, and all the folks at Beat SMB, and especially your members who voted for us. Uh, it's quite an honor uh, to be recognized by your peers. Um, we're huge fans of the work you do to sort of bring together not only our industry, but you know, just in support of small business owners. But in terms of our story, um, I was introduced to my co-founder, Venkat, while we both were entrepreneurs and residents at a Boston venture capital firm, um, we kind of immediately connected over a shared passion for small business and our desire to help them succeed. Now, prior to Alignable, I'd spent 10 and a half years at Constant Contact, actually with Maureen. Um, and there we were helping businesses bring their existing customers back. Um, but there seemed to be a much larger opportunity. Uh, Venkat and I talked about the isolation felt by many small business owners, uh, how word of mouth referrals were so critical for success, and ultimately kind of gravitated around this feeling of how strange it was at the time that there was no online, online network that was really dedicated just to their needs. Uh, so in 2012, we founded Alignable um, with a simple belief that small business owners were stronger together. Uh, and we could build a solution just for them. So we're now the world's largest online network for small business owners, where we really foster connecting, businesses connecting with each other, uh, the sharing of best practices between them and advice sharing. Um, and ultimately, um, we enable our members to grow their business uh, through referrals, customer referrals, product referrals, and word of mouth marketing in general. So that's what we're all about. And, and at this stage, you are actually a community now of over, last I checked, it was six and a half million. Is that number grown? I would assume it has. Um, yeah, we're almost to seven million, but don't tell anybody because, you know, we can't tell anyone until we cross the threshold. But I'm a sales guy, so I always round up. But uh, yeah, we're almost seven million. Well, across um, U.S. and Canada. Don't don't tell <laughs> anyone. But as we record this on, on the Friday morning for the event, you guys are one of the three finalists for brand mm. of the year, but don't tell anyone that yet. It's actually okay. being announced today. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm very excited for you because I think that, that um, the, would you say Maureen, when you kind of entered into the company that mm -hmm. the, the essence of the Alignable brand was actually this enormous community of small business? Absolutely, I mean, they are our brand. Um, you know, we talk about how we have this great technology that brings it together, but what truly makes our brand stand out and be authentic are our members and how they support and help each other. You know, you, you have been a little more than a year with the organization. No, not, it seems like it sometimes. But no. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. It feels like five no, years. No, just about, just about, um, about 10 months. Yes. So yep. as a marketing challenge, what attracted you to Alignable? Yeah, so I will say hands down, it was the mission. Um, you know, given where I was in my career and what was going on in this world, the little this little thing called COVID, um, I wanted to really to give back and, and to help. And our members are really the, the risk takers and the problem solvers. They're the hearts and souls of our community. And what Alignable does is they put their needs at the center of everything that we do. Um, everyone on the team at Alignable is either a small business owner, they're friends and family of small business owners or they're um, really entrepreneurs um, and they have a tremendous empathy for small business owners. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would just say is just Alignable is a team in the truest sense of the word from our two founders right on down the line. I mean, 
everyone is in it together. We roll up our sleeves, work together, and mm -hmm. just really are bought into this mission of, of helping uh, helping small businesses. When it came time to um, build the marketing playbook and build your marketing plan, obviously you've got a budget, you've got objectives, all the rest of the things that kind of come with the job title. What, how did you start that process in 10 months ago? How did you really kind of start to think about, okay, I've got to think in terms of what I admire as a brand, but now I have to turn it into a form of, of, of a marketing plan. Talking to our members, that was the first thing I did. I mean, just really lots of conversations, you know, what what drew them to Alignable? What were the things that they, they what was the value that they were getting from it? Um, and again, it went back to this very authentic community that has been created. And again, that's them build, building those relationships together. And, and, and I think, I don't know about you, but in the many marketing assignments that I've had over 35 plus years, it is funny how oftentimes marketers actually don't talk to customers. <laughs> don't actually start there. They start with kind of abstract research and all sorts of other things to kind of boil down their essential plan. And you ask them, did you ever talk to anybody who actually is going to be on the receiving end of this? No. Right. I mean, that's something that we all do all the time. Um, yeah. You know, I when you think about building your brand as a marketer, to me, it's it starts with creating very... Um, putting your employees at the center and creating exceptional employee experiences that then mm -hmm. will drive exceptional customer experiences. When you have the two of those together, um, that that is what drives your brand. And our customers know our members by name. The members know our customers by name. The mm -hmm. members love that they have access to the Alignable team. The Alignable team loves it has that it has access to, to, our, um, to our members. And those mm -hmm. two really drive that human connection. So Eric, along the way, you and Venkat were building kind of this extraordinary but quite virtuous feedback loop with your with your members. Were they really instrumental in kind of constructing each phase of your development? And, and most importantly, you've always stayed very, very true and very centered on your mission, but also on your model that you weren't going to basically use this growing community of now close to 7 million small businesses to sell advertising, for instance, or to hawk mailing lists. So, I mean, if, if you can kind of, I know there's really two big separate questions, but if you can kind of bundle it together, what, how did you learn what you learned along the way? And how did you, how did you manage to stay so true to your mission? Um, well, uh, I'm going to go back just a little bit because first of all, Maureen sort of underplayed her impact a little bit. I mean, she came on board, there was no marketing organization really, right? She built the whole thing from scratch. And the other thing that was, you know, sort of in her DNA was you know, her husband runs a small business and she's been in constant contact for many years. So, you know, we're surrounded by small business owners and, you know, even more so when you can find someone to run marketing that literally can you know, talk across the breakfast table to someone who's running one. So I think, you know, that's how, that's what we search for. And, you know, you talk about sort of how did we get um, this small business DNA? Well, it started from the very outset, the day Venkat and I met, he was actually talking to small business owners about an application that he had built, a mobile app that would do push um, advertising. And he walked into one of the people he'd been talking to, a guy that owns a restaurant. And he sort, of, he sort of said to Venkat, that's a really cool application. I don't really think i will use that, but aren't you talking to the guy that owns the wine store across the street? And Venkat's like, yeah, yo, Tim, yeah, of course I am. And he's like, well, could you just introduce me to him? And Venkat's like, you know, this is a guy who's made a career out of taking things that are done one way forever and using technology to totally change them. And he literally was dumbfounded. Like, why don't you walk across the street and introduce yourself to him? He's like, well, you know, I've kind of tried, but the employees there are really trained to kind of deflect people away from the owner because they're they're tired. The owner doesn't want to be sold to anymore, right? They just, you know, they get so many people coming in and selling. So I joined the chamber to hope that I'd meet them there. And I just haven't been able to connect with them, you know? And it was funny because Venkat literally, you know, I knew Tim really well because we both lived in the same town. And we're like, well, let's just introduce them to each other. And you, know, you reached out to Tim and he's like, oh, of course, come by anytime, you know? And it was like, oh my gosh, right? So there's just, there's this sort of friction that was created 
by all of the companies that were trying to sell stuff to small businesses that business owners were kind of hesitant to want to talk to someone walking in the door because they thought they were going to be tried to be sold something. And that fear kind of created a sense of anxiety and um, friction in helping business owners come together and talk to each other. And it turned out that was sort of the very first thing that we started to build was simply the ability to let them see all of the business owners in their community and literally reach out and say, hey, do you want to grab coffee? Now, do you want to do a virtual one-on-one, -on -one? whatever? You know? and, and so we've sort of kept that notion in our heads of you have to go back and ask small business owners, what is the pain you're feeling? How can we help? And we do that you know, through surveys, through talking to them, and literally, we've got a whole bunch of ambassadors on the platform that love to give us feedback. And it's, it's a daily thing that we're always doing because we simply want to help. And the only way to do that is to talk to them and help them fi and figure out what they're struggling with. Yeah, and um, I will just add another great story in there is that you know how they continue to drive our brand is that, and I mentioned before how they help each other. So during, um, during the height of the pandemic, we had a florist on our platform that um, didn't have her supplier. She didn't have flowers. And so that meant she couldn't fill her orders and that meant she couldn't put dinner on the table, right? So 20 business owners jumped in and, and said, oh, you can use my supplier. Or I have flowers in my backyard that you can have. Um, so they really just band together. And that is really our, our brand and our mission coming to life. What a great story. So, so unpack a little bit, Maureen, how you very specifically have used the the survey, the feedback loop from members as part of constructing the content, the creative that you are messaging out to prospects of Alignable or new members of Alignable. Sure. I mean, it, like we've said a few times, that member feedback drives everything that we do um, from the surveys that we do to the insights that we that we gather from our member success team. Um, we know one of our core values is being customer obsessed at the core, and that's no different in marketing. Um, we use the trends that we see that we get from our surveys to sharpen our educational offerings to our areas of focus in marketing, the solutions that we create. Um, and I think you know the best thing about the surveys that we've done so far and the data that we've collected is it's helped to inform Congress and it's helped to actually make changes um, that, that have helped small business owners. Do you envision, um... And correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe you guys have stepped into the breach of what I would describe as a large scale image campaign that, you know, one like Indeed is doing right now where, you know, you need employees, Indeed you do, or, or like Square is doing, or like American Express has done. Um, again, as a, as, a, as a brand marketer, do you feel like I don't really need to do that? I, I've, got, I've got much more power basically in the way I'm more down at a grassroots level, or is that something that you really envision doing in the future, a big branding campaign? You know, it could be in the future, you know, you never know exactly what the future holds, but I feel like today we are the voice of small business. And so they're our voice, right? They want to hear from each other. Um, they trust each other. So that really becomes the focus of our brand. How do we bring those voices and how do we bring those, those members to life? So I'll ask you this, th this question first to you, Maureen, but then Eric to you. So is there really a double-edged sword to being a very small business customer member driven kind of organization where Maureen, you're taking so much of your brand essence from an extraordinarily large, extraordinarily fragmented, extraordinarily skeptical, generally, um, you know, it's a tough audience. Is it does it make the job harder or does it actually make the job more focused and, and easier in a way? Um, it's a great question. Uh, you know, I think there's never a shortage of opinions at Alignable, whether it's with our employees <laughs> or with our members. So in being a marketer, I'm, you're used to that, right? Um, but, you know, again, I, I keep going back to this idea that the best part about our brand is that it's authentic. Um, and, you know, my job is less about being a gatekeeper of how communication is, is, is uh, written and more about are we living up to our brand promise? Are we really delivering on what we've promised our members? Um, so when you think about things like, you know, brand guidelines and things like that, sure, we have those um, that we try to stick to with alignable driven communications and things like that. But again, it's really the voice of the small business owner and it's their voice that's important. Um, 
it's on us to help empower them and make sure they have the right messaging and I would say the the right tools as they're as they're kind of spreading the word but it really should be in their words to make it authentic um Eric mentioned our ambassador program something we just launched recently where we're empowering local leaders to bring together other small business owners to foster the creation of really meaningful relationships community support personal growth that's our brand like that that becomes our brand so and, yeah, and, Eric, and the only thing that I would add, I'd add to that is that, you know, we've all seen how social media affects brands, right? You know, you can see, you know, what happens when United Airlines does something bad or Chase Manhattan does something bad or whomever, right? The, the, the impact that Twitter and Facebook and Instagram can have on those brands. And essentially with the creation of social media, consumer brands realized that they no, no longer owned their brands, their followers and their fans did. Well, the interesting thing about Alignable is we're a community of 7 million small businesses. So all of the small business brands in a sense have now lost ownership of their brand because it was very hard before Alignable for small business owners in mass to talk about things. Mm -hmm. Right. But now on a platform like Alignable, they could literally post something and, and, and potentially reach millions of small other small business owners. So we've grown up re recognizing that our brand was in the hands of our members and really tried to foster, you know, our mission to them so that they understood what we were trying to do. And we have, you know, massive attractors. We've got some detractors. But at the end of the day, we realized that we have to be loyal to them because they own our brand. And the most fascinating thing I think is the realization that through our platform now, companies like you know, Intuit, American Express, Chase, all of those folks, they, you know, they've literally handed their brand over to their customers and they just don't know it because they, they're, not, they're not part of the platform. Um, but ultimately that's ha what happens with social platforms. Um, do you think that, that the the message is clear as we kind of emerge from the pandemic and hopefully knock on wood we're all headed steering into recovery are you hearing from those power users are you hearing from those attractors kind of clear direction on what's next for you from an offering standpoint i mean obviously you could just stay the course and say okay i'm at seven million now or close to seven million now and really my upside is another seven million um, or it could go global or any number of things, just doing what I'm doing right now, not really changing a thing about the model or, or the offering, or is there really kind of a moment in time here where you're going, yeah, you know, if we could just do this, or this is what they need next. Yeah, well, that's a great question. And if you, you asked our VP of product, he'd probably <laughs> scream right out of the room <laughs> because we're always thinking about what's next, right? Coward. Um, and you know, yeah, <laughs> well, no, he's got a lot on his plate. Um, you know, I think if you just look at what happened during the pandemic, right? I mean, all of a sudden, um, the ability to network in person <laughs> went away and we all had to shift online. You look at purchasing, you know, e-commerce, shopping carts on websites, all of a sudden, everybody had to have them, gift cards, everybody had to have them. And, you know, COVID really changed the way small businesses do business, whether you're a restaurant or a fitness center, you know, everything changed. And so we had to adapt to that. And so we listened to what they needed. And, you know, when, when you know, as Maureen pointed out, when this, this florist was struggling, we literally on the fly created our very first group. We said, let's, let's create a group and let's put everybody that we know as a florist in it and let's let them talk to each other. And it was almost like a survival group. Well, now there are you know, thousands of groups across the platform, uh, groups for minority-owned businesses, for women-owned businesses, for doctors, dentists, lawyers, website developers, you name it. Um, there's a group out there for businesses to kind of get together and talk to each other. And so that was one of the really powerful things we did. The other thing was we realized that virtual events were critical. So within any, any group, you can actually spin up a virtual event. Um, you can, within a messaging thread, you can spin up a one-on-one -on -one video chat. <clears throat> and these are all things that we did really in support of the challenges that they were facing. And the last one I'll point out is the one sort of near and dear to my heart right here um, is, you know, we, we created an initiative called One Main Street, which was really all about helping people 
realize that the answer to this problem of you know small businesses and local businesses struggling was literally within ourselves, right? We are all part of one main street. Where we spend our money matters. And trying to get people to realize that when COVID hit, we all shifted our purchasing behavior to big box retailers and people like Amazon. Well, that drained our local communities of a vast resource called our spending. And we have to shift that back. And so we started an initiative in support of that. But everything we're doing is kind of behind the scenes, trying to lift them up rather than trying to you know, be out in front of them saying, you must do this. We're listening and adapting our product. And that's why you know, we're still listening. And that guy who's the VP of product is you know, pulling his hair out, but that's okay, he'll survive. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, listen, I think that, that um, it, it, you've got a tiger by the tail, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly powerful piece of your, of your, your business proposition. And, and at the same time, you are asking for it. You are asking for, for your members to kind of drive your product development. And, you know, let's just say for argument's sake that it's really only 10% of that 7 million population that's truly vocal about what you want to do next. That's 700,000. <laughs> that's 700,000 yeah. people knocking on his door metaphorically and saying, hey, could you do this? So agree. I, I, I will exactly. say though, I think as an organization, though, we are out front in the sense that we understand, as Eric mentioned, the world has changed. And in that, mm -hmm. it's a digital first world now. And the online reputation of our small business owners, both them and their business, is so much more important. So we're always thinking mm -hmm. about new tools and new features, um, and then obviously taking their feedback with that as well. So Maureen, let me ask you an unfair CMO question. Um, so imagine that you are, not that you would ever want to leave your current assignment, but imagine you are parachuted <laughs> into another large B to SMB brand. And let's just say for argument's sake that you're actually, you find them attractive. You find, this is a good brand. This is a good, uh, a good place to be. Mm -hmm. What are the things that you would bring in to that new marketing assignment that you have learned in the last 10 months or that now really are kind of foundational for you as to, yeah, it has to be this. We have to do this. What are those things? So I don't know if it's a if it's a new thing I've learned or more just kind of the um, emphasizing what I already knew is just the voice. Fair of enough. Customer. Fair enough. I mean, it's just it's so important. I've I've kind of that's been rooted in me since probably even days before Constant Contact. But that is just being understanding your audience and being that voice for your customer is just the most important thing. Yeah, I, and and I think that that I wish that CMO the title was rewritten to being Chief Customer Officer for everybody. I mean, because that's really what. The marketer is essentially meant to do is represent the 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 customers in every Absolutely. conversation in the organization. So, Eric, is there anything about the model of Alignable, not necessarily the product, but in the model of Alignable that you see changing as you know, and not to you know, you don't have to spill the tea here, but is there anything that you know you see doing in the next as as Alignable evolves and grows? Anything that you see from a model standpoint doing any differently? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things you can point out because we've already sort of started down that path. I mean, one was the, what Maureen talked about with the ambassadors uh, and the ability to create groups and, you know, to enable people if they want to create a paid group to do so. Um, I think those are all things that we're kind of marching down the path of. Um, but I think there's also a massive opportunity, you know, you know, one of the sort of phobias that we talked about earlier of this you know, being a small business owner and having somebody come at you and try and sell you stuff, you know, seven to 10 times a week, so, uh, small business owners are getting a phone call or someone's walking in the door and trying to sell them something. And that's not how they like to buy, right? The way that they like to buy is they like to understand how to solve a problem and to sort of suss out all of the different solutions that are out there and then make a really informed decision. And so one of the initiatives that we recently launched was this sort of problem solving marketplace, right? It's a place where you can go and you can learn about a problem. In this case, the first one we rolled out was all about hiring, right? And so we, we did a survey to understand, so what are the trends? What's, what's holding you back in hiring? And there was a huge emphasis around hourly workers, trying to find hourly workers. Well, a fascinating thing has happened over the last six months, and that is the advent of the gig economy 
um, uh, job seekers, right? And sort of employ employees that would come in and do a shift and then they would leave. Well, there's been a whole new sort of industry created around that and our business owners didn't know about it. So we did an, you know, sort of a deep dive into all of the players from Indeed um, on down. And we literally created a marketplace um, where they can go learn about these changes of what's happened in the industry. They can find groups that they can go to talk with people who are struggling with hiring and finding solutions. They can go to their industry group and talk to other people in their industry. They can ask an expert on the platform. So we've got, we've identified a whole bunch of people who are HR experts and they can actually ask a question and have it sent to those folks and get answers. And then we also use our net promoter scores to really, that we've been capturing over the years to, to really say, well, if you're looking for a solution, you can go here um, to find members on the platform who can provide that solution. And you can go here to find brands that provide a solution. And based on the, the ratings and reviews, these are the top brands to consider. Well, now a business owner doesn't have to hyperventilate about being sold. They can go learn, they can talk, they can educate themselves, they can make a decision and they can find a pathway to that solution. And so we're rolling those out. Um, you know, this is one of the things that Maureen and her team are doing is we're rolling those out um, on a, basically on a monthly basis all around problems, whether it's cash flow, you know, marketing, hiring, you name it, um, those solutions are going to be put in place. And I think it's going to be a vast resource for small business owners really finding all the resources they need to be successful. That's, yeah, that's and we're absolutely. actually we're asking our our members what's their priority, right? And that's how we're that's how we're deciding what to roll out mm -hmm. next. What are they struggling with today, and um, using that to guide us. And and the best part about it, I would imagine, is is that by virtue of kind of asking them, you're hearing it in their language. Um, you know, Eric, you remember when we were when we were building BizHive back in 2011, 2012 one of our aha moments, um, which really revealed how incredibly arrogant we were, um, was that we had, we had basically set up a kind of an informational marketplace directed at small business under mastheads effectively that we invented. So we mm -hmm. said, small businesses want to learn about reputation management. So we're going to have a whole basically resource center around reputation management. And it didn't get any play, frankly. And we went out and bought lots of display advertising and keyword search on reputation management. It was very expensive and very unresponsive. A, a, an intern working in, in the summer as we're kind of, you know, noodling the conundrum of why aren't people responding to reputation management? It's supposed to be huge. She said out loud, I wonder if all they want to do is just fix a bad Yelp review. And it was kind of an aha moment on all of us wise people who were sitting around the table going, well, why don't we just try that? And sure enough, we bought at a significantly less expensive rate, keyword search around reputation management, we bought how to fix a bad Yelp review. And it became instantly our number one search and our yeah. number one responsive traffic driver to the site. And I think that's the, that's the beauty part, Maureen, I would imagine as the marketer is, is that I don't really have to work very hard here if I just listen. Well, let's not say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we test those types of words all the time. Words like Q4, like that's very innate in all of us to say, doesn't resonate. Right. Like, so our, my team is testing that constantly. And that just goes back to my voice of customer and words of customer, right? You have to speak in their terms and know your audience. Absolutely. And, and honestly, that is why you have to kind of uh, have sympathy for anyone who's trying to introduce a really terrific concept like low code, no code. I was just talking to someone the other day about, you know, low code, no code is the democratization of small businesses being able to kind of write their own, their own uh, software solutions. And I'm like, good luck with that. I mean, that is, yeah. what does that, that is, mean? What's what is the that? Pain? I mean, from the engineer's yeah. end, yeah, I get what it means. It's, you know, it's, yeah. you don't have to write a lot of fancy code to actually get something done on your platform, but God help yeah. you in trying to translate that to a small business. Yeah. Anyway. I used yeah to have that's a, like, um, you know, how do I fix my website? Right. Yeah. Right. It's like my website's broken. How do I fix it? Oh, okay. right. We used to right. have an um, an art director that would just call it chicken on a plate. Like, call it what it is. It's chicken on a plate. Yeah. <laughs> That's terrific. 
you got to love those art directors who come up with the most sensible ways of describing things. <laughs> uh, that's great. Well, this has been terrific and tre tremendously uh, informative. Congratulations again for being a finalist. Um, uh, the accounting firm is showing up later today and is going to <laughs> count the actual number of votes for the winner of, of brand of the year. They will seal it in a briefcase. I will have no access to it. So no calls this weekend. On, <laughs> did we win? But congratulations again. It's been terrific to hear you guys' story and, uh, and of all the things that you do to, to be recognized for the brand that you've built, I think actually is very important. Congrats. Well, thanks very Thank much. You. Thanks.